Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Historians Without Borders, for inviting me. I'm delighted. Um, I was born in Africa, but this is my first time in South Africa, so it's very important for us um, Cameroonian-borns because uh, South Africa uh, um, was, for my mother at least, uh, uh, a very fierce activist, was an example, and, and, and it's a country that uh, kind of guide her in her intellectual journey. Now, um, before we start, I'd like to give credit to some of my role models, um, people who shaped my intellectual journey as well. Stuart Hall, Elikia Mbokolo, Françoise Vergès, and many, many others. There's a, a kind of 45-minute uh, version of this talk, and there are mentions in there. But I had to cut it. I've been, in fact, I've been editing this paper until an hour ago. Now, in 1984, historian Pierre Nora published his first volume on, of his uh, four-part research on the history of France and uh, the realms of memory. The French title, Lieu de mémoire, was translated by Sites of Memory or by Realms of Memory. What Nora described were places of remembrance that echoed the demand, aspirations and hopes of communities. While I have since fallen out of love, uh, from uh, Pierre Noir's work, but I would forever be grateful for his wide definition of the term site of memory. For Nora, books, anniversaries, monuments, festivals, etc. are sites of memory. I have argued that knowledge produced in those sites of memory further contribute to reinforcing those demands, aspirations and hopes. Knowledge produced about specific events becomes a site of memory. In other words, narratives, research, debate about the colonial past are locus for debate, a terrain for power struggle susceptible to manipulation. So if we go further, knowledge production mechanisms can become sites of memory as well. So it's not just about what is produced, but the way specific narratives are produced and how they reveal power struggle and mechanisms of erasure of history of some colonial and post-colonial subjects. Over the last few years, the recurrent debate about the role, impact, and legacies of the British and French empires have dominated academic discourses in France and in the UK. Those debates are mostly about the pros and the cons of empires. Yet, at the heart of these often controversial discussions is the question of the place of the descendants of colonial or former colonial subjects in given Western societies. I'm arguing that the recurrent debate is a symptom of profoundly disturbed societies that are refusing or to be more generous, that are having a hard time knowing how to deal with the legacies of the past. Psychologist Jacques Lacan had written about memory and he argued that memory is not sim a simple representation of the past. He contended that unconscious, painful memory appears to us in the form of pain. Pain becomes a symptom of something else. That something else is causing us to repeat certain things over and over again, whether they bring pleasure or pain. It's like a compulsion to remember and to perform what we remember. All this implies a degree of consciousness and premeditation, perhaps, that is in fact not always present. Another sociologist, or rather psychologist, brought the idea of collective unconsciousness, defined it such a part of the unconscious mind shared by a society, a people or all humankind that is the product of ancestral experience. Well, this is exactly what is happening regarding the debate about the legacy of the British and French empires in France and in Britain. Europe and Britain and France are bound to go round and round the same mountain, all over again to use a biblical metaphor because they are only partially dealing with the impact of the history of colonialism. Um, in various communities. That need to reshape the history of empires, excluding the stories of certain colonial subjects, is not new. Forgetting about the past is not a new phenomenon. Remembering and forgetting are indeed two sides of the same coin. In fact, a few historians have argued that forgetting trauma are important for nation building. Post-war Britain, for example, invited people from the Caribbean to come and rebuild the so-called mother country. They came in are often referred to as the Windrush generation. They find themselves discriminated against by the local population, the local white population. They were nonetheless needed 
They stayed, had families, and continued to contribute to the nation's economy. The same thing happened in France. But while these were there, Successive French and British governments were busy, busy regu regulating the movement of black and brown bodies through a series of laws. Riots and demands from those communities led to race relation acts. Now, what is of interest to me is that while all these things were happening, <laughs> school curriculum were overlooked. Why is it important? The discourses about nationhood are also articulated around the notion of identity. It's about writing on what it means to be British or French and widely sharing those narratives of the past that are deemed acceptable and relevant to the population, to the wider population. School curriculum do, do bring those imperatives together. The dominance of certain narratives is significant and simply tell us that Britain wanted to celebrate empire and ignore black and Asian presence and contribution to empire building. The curriculum is one important area but there are others that in many ways bring the history of colonialism to life. Survey have shown uh, that a good number of people get their information about historical events through, in Britain at least, through documentary, BBC documentaries, but these are for people who actually are, are already interested in history. For the rest, well, they use things like films, music. Um, two years in a row, we have had two British films about Winston Churchill with an emphasis on rendering him endearing by showing his flaws as a man. The problem is that he's already seen as a national hero, so it's about reinforcing those narratives of a single strong hero who saved Second World War Britain, thus erasing his role in colonial project and his well documented, and this is very well documented. We also had a high budget British movie called Dunkirk, Dunkirk artistically celebrated it did not mention soldiers from empire, their contribution in France to ending the Second World War. Movies are partic participating in narratives about the past and colonial history. Incidentally, you, you would have seen that Gary Oldman won the, uh, the award, the, uh, the, um, the Oscars for his uh, interpretation or his, uh, his role as Winston Churchill. So you can only imagine at home uh, how this is celebrated and reinforcing that narrative of a single hero who saved the, the, the country. So if children of former empires, now British and French, are not, are not represented in those narratives or cannot identify with those narratives, then so-called social cohesion measures put in place in multicultural societies in Europe are bound to fail in the long run, as sociologists have shown. Britain and France have revised their school curriculum, but the fight is constant. In 2001, France acknowledged that slavery was a crime against humanity. The school textbooks were revised and new ones appeared. In 2015, 16, 17, teachers and academics had to fight the government because the history of Africa had been removed from the curriculum. The history that was presented was the history of slavery. Why is that important? Well, first, it wasn't the history of slavery that was presented by the history of abolition. In other words, how France and Europe and Britain abolished the, slave, uh, abolished the trade that they themselves initiated, which was the transatlantic slave trade. What teachers and myself fought hard to have was a curriculum that included the history of pre-colonial Africa, because we thought that it was crucial for minority and majority groups to understand that Africa had a history. For all of you, it's obvious, right? Well, the fallacy that history exists only in a written form through archives still dominates the way the past is taught in Britain and France. Archaeological findings about Africa, African oral history, and even Arabic written Timbuktu manuscripts are rarely mentioned or used in European curriculum as significant source material to teach about African history. So it was easy for the right-wing parties and far-right parties to say that Africa didn't have a history. You may remember former President Nicolas Sarkozy's Dakar uh, speech, now infamous Dakar speech, in which he said that the African man had not entered history. This speech just echoed basic far-right debate and links with old but very much alive beliefs in eugenics and racial hierarchy in France, despite the fact that, of course, um, race does not exist in France, right? As far as Britain is concerned, more recently, about a couple of months ago, 
and I'll mention, uh, my colleague mentioned that earlier, a huge controversy started when an Oxford professor received a grant, government money, to do research on ethics and colonialism. The idea was to look at the pros and cons of empire, including the British Empire. The controversy based on this current, recurrent discussion about how the British built roads, railways, and hospitals for the indigenous population was very much at the heart of the disagreement. Well, we do know that they were not done for the benefit of the colonized, but for, to ship raw material, carry goods, designed to build the motherland, in fact. More importantly, the project proposed to do balance and checks of empires. So how can one do balance and checks with railway built in, for instance, India, on one side in the Bengal famine, famine, um, famine sorry, in 1943, where about two million people died? Of course, you do know that it was an induced famine. Okay. Um, I wondered, amongst this debate, really, what is this about? We talked about writing, school curriculum, movies. All this reminds me, really, of what scholar Yanin um, Aleida Asman talk, uh, talks about when they talk about cultural memory or the outer dimensional memory. It's really society's ability to preserve its collective memory and to pass it on to the next generations through cultural artifacts. These I'm adding include um, photography. Memory expert Marianne Hirsch also showed how the transmission operates and can be a wonderful vehicle for um, historical reconciliation and a healing process. The term that comes back over and over here is the notion of collective memory. Again, we take it for granted, but it is a multi-dimensional term coined by French sociologist Maurice Alvax. For Alvax, memory is first and foremost a collective experience. Memory does not exist outside communities. For philosopher Paul Ricoeur, memory is an individual journey. Something happens, we share it with our family, neighbors, communities, nations, etc. It starts at an individual level. So to go from factual details, history, to people's perception, sorry, perception of those facts, memory, there is, a, this is a big jump. Both history and memory matter. But then, to do checks and balance on the past, perceptions, emotions, lived experiences is very difficult. It is therefore unrealistic to expect to reach one single all-encompassing result, such as empire was good, full stop. Uh, do we actually ask ourselves, was slavery good? Was the Holocaust good? No, we don't, usually. The debate is still raging, but because it is based on the good versus bad, it touches upon the question of compensation received, for instance, for the British, by the British and French slave owners, and on the one side, that's one side, and on the other side, repression demands from former colonies and descendants of children from those colonies. I want to give you a final example of how difficult, complex the debate about the past is and how platforms used to write about those stories have changed. Last month, Her Majesty Treasury, UK Government Economic and Finance Ministry posted the following words on Twitter. Here's today's surprising Friday fact. Millions of you help end the slave trade through your taxes, end of quote. Given that most under 20s get a great deal of information from social media first, including information about history, and I know this because my, my students search on social media when I do them, ask them to do assessment and assignment first, it was significant that a government's body as important as the Treasury deemed it appropriate to congratulate British citizens for having paid to end the slave trade. Well, what they should have said was that 20 million pounds were paid to slave owners to compensate them for the loss of their property, and former slaves received nothing. What they should have said is that about 20% of that money was invested in Britain, and it was indeed taxpayers' money that was used to pay slave traders. Hardly anything to celebrate at a time when unemployment is high, the perspective of Brexit is gloomy, and the overall population is demoralized by the use of public funds. Now, as a historian, I found this absolutely fascinating, but debunking those myths was done via social media, because we know that our students and people under and around 20, the, um, the age of 20, will be reading those. 
Later on, of course, as is often the case, public figures wrote articles about this for the benefit of a wider audience. So you will find a Guardian, the independent version of this, but it does not give you a sense of the passion and the overall um, fierceness of the debate. So the platforms to share, write, debate, argue about colonial history have changed. So what about the relationship between North and South as far as his history is concerned? Um, it is an interesting one. Remember, the Rosemary's Fall started here, the debate about toppling statues reached Ghana, um, and removal of uh, Gandhi's statue in Accra. But the writing of the history of colonialism remained the locus for a fierce intellectual battle that ties into the rise of populism, so-called alt-right narratives that are basically a debate about the alleged threats uh, about a uh, white minority fighting for their, for their survival and the, supremacy, the uh, white supremacy, supremacist ideology. About six months ago, and my colleague mentioned this as well, an associate professor in political sciences published an article entitled The Case for Colonialism, basically ignoring the work done, tons of work, done by historians of empire, colonialism, who went on to say that, quote, Western colonialism was, a general, as a general rule, both objectively beneficial, subjectively legitimate in most of the places where it was found. Um, in our age of apology for atrocities, one of the main conspicuous silences has been an apology for the many atrocities visited upon third world people by anti-colonial advocates. In other words, um, anti-colonial um, kind of heroes um, were not that good as well, actually. So. After an online debate, a passionate one, the three-quarter of the journal's members, um, editorial member, resigned. The article was removed, but the author apologized, but promised that he will come back. So he actually withdrew his apology. One could argue, that, but he withdrew his apology because he had had the support of white, um, uh, white right-wing, alt-right um, uh, media. One could argue that it was an example, really, his article was an example of fake news, except given the status of the writer, a PhD holder, associate professor, it could not be debunked by those who did not work on those histories. It took letters and strict combing of the article to have the publisher removed it. However, what do we make of this? Can we see that there's a, a, a kind of fierce and strong links between ideology, political agenda, and history, or histories. Our role as historians is to teach all, and I insist, all aspects of this history. But how do we do that when we know that histories, history and historians are not the guardians of the past, and when we also know that we all come as academics with our own beliefs and are influenced by our background? I think accepting these is important as well. Dominant narratives or meta-narratives of the British and French Empire past are responsible for the current situation. Lack of integration of stories of those who contributed to making empires is one of the reasons why we are in this rather messy situation whereby groups are fighting about the way the past should be written. The Rosemets Fall movement in Britain polarized the debate around statues and the use of public and urban landscape. The argument against toppling statues was Either we shouldn't do that because, well, in Britain at least, either we shouldn't do that because, well, we wouldn't have any statues left in Britain since most people who um, actually have statues have been involved with empire, some way or the other. And then the next step was to say empire was not all that bad, hence the, you know, the research I mentioned. On the other side, you find the decolonial movement with why is my curriculum so white, decolonizing the academy, and more recently, the revelation by student unions that, uh, about the links between certain universities in the UK and eugenics agenda with secret conferences and talks still taking place about eugenics. Eugenics are ways to improve human stocks, um, how to eliminate uh, inferior races, marginalized groups, and people with disability. And I'm talking about something that happened um, three weeks ago. <coughs> I would invite us to reflect on a few things and ways to perhaps to move forward. I'm not giving answers, um, that's, that's quite difficult and presumptuous, but perhaps if we reshape our questions. Um, in the British and French contexts, do we need to remove statues to decolonize? I'm not saying I'm against, I'm just asking. Do we need to remove them to decolonize? <laughs> 
These are questions that I compile because my students, all white, come over and over again. And I find myself trying to justify or to defend. So I would like us to go back to this and reflect on um, the majority group, how do they feel about this, and why, and, and, and why some don't understand why we should or shouldn't remove those statues. Second question, how do we decolonize all mentalities? We talked about, we talk often about white and brown privilege. What happens when black people accept that privilege? And they do accept that privilege sometimes. Third point, bearing in mind that who tells the story matters just as much as what is told, how do we integrate multi-directional, multi-dimensional narratives of the past that are acceptable to multicultural societies as a whole? Final point, how do we foster a greater integration of narratives from the South into the North? My colleague was saying that should we, maybe we shouldn't even try to do that. I'm arguing that as a child, as a, an Afro-European child, and my children are Afro-Europeans, and it doesn't matter whether your parents is black or white, when you're third generation African, somehow, somewhere, your children end up thinking that they're also European and African. So how do we integrate narratives from the South into the North in a way that it meant that it, it's helpful for those children uh, of second, third generation?